Chinese Revolution of uh, 1949 was the second greatest event in world history so far. The revolution smashed capitalism and landlordism in the world's largest country. It replaced the decrepit Chinese capitalist state with a worker state, albeit a deeply deformed one. It was a monumental step forward. Millions of human pe beings who had lived desperate lives of toil, working away to enrich the capitalists at, at home and abroad, stood up, threw off the yoke of imperialism. Uh, and you know, for these reasons, I, I think the Chinese Revolution has a, a tremendous power to inspire workers and, and young people who are looking for their own way out of, uh, of this capitalist nightmare. And I say that from experience. You know, when I uh, first got involved in the, the broader socialist movement, I found the first 50 years of the Chinese Communist Party's history absolutely electrifying. Uh, you know, the, uh, the heroism and determination of the guerrilla struggle, the, uh, the, the color and liveliness of, of the propaganda posters, the, the concise poetry of, of the slogans, all of that was uh, incredibly attractive to me. Um, and I think it's attractive to a lot of other people. So it's absolutely essential for every communist to understand this revolution and to integrate its lessons into our vital political work, building a mass communist party and a new communist international. But the Chinese revolution presents certain theoretical problems for us. Uh, this revolution did not proceed along the lines of a classical bourgeois revolution like the English revolution of 1640 to 1660 or the French revolution of 1789. Um, at the same time, it didn't follow the pattern set by the, the world's most successful proletarian revolution, the revolution we talked about yesterday, the Russian Revolution of 1917. And I think the Chinese Revolution departed from the classical formula of a proletarian revolution uh, in two major ways. Firstly, you know, it's, it's not the fact that the, the Chinese working class got increasingly well organized in the course of its struggle against the capitalists, so much so that it could launch a wave of strikes and uh, and mass demonstrations, general strikes, uprisings, eventually uh, an insurrection. Now, in point of fact, the, the class struggle in China's industrial centers was developing uh, along that path in the 1940s, but it never got to the end of it. Uh, it never got to the stage of open insurrection. And for that reason, the Chinese working class was not the decisive factor in the revolution. Instead, you know, the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, uh, came into power when its army, the People's Liberation Army, won a civil war. And that civil war, until its final phase, took place uh, almost entirely in the countryside. Uh, the, the second way that the Chinese Revolution departs from what we expect of a, of a proletarian revolution is that history has shown us, in both a, a positive and a negative way, that the working class can only take power when its most advanced elements, you know, what we call the vanguard of the working class, are organized into a communist party. And this party has got to be uh, more uh, far-sighted, you know, have, have firmer uh, thought, more revolutionary determination than any other type of political party. Uh, and, and to achieve this, its cadres have got to be steeled in Marxist theory. They've got to possess clear perspectives, and they've got to have a revolutionary program uh, behind which the, the working class masses can unite. Um, now, the Communist Party of China was founded to be exactly that type of party. But by 1949, it had long since ceased to be a workers' party uh, in, in composition. Uh, and despite its official declarations, it had long ceased uh, to, to be a party that, that was behind the ideas of genuine Marxist-Leninism. Uh, so we're dealing with a peculiar phenomenon here. So the CCP was founded in uh, 1921 in, in Shanghai uh, at a congress of, of about 12 delegates, and these delegates represented no more than 60 communists throughout the vast country. 
Uh, and so the, the Chinese Communist Party, when it was founded, significantly smaller than the, the number of people uh, in this room. Uh, but it had big goals. You know, the stated goals were to overthrow the power of the capitalist class and to eradicate capitalism and private ownership of property in China. Uh, and one of the main political discussions they had at this Congress was, what is the nature of, of the Chinese revolution that we know is coming around the corner? And within four short years of that founding Congress and that discussion, the party was thrown into the turmoil of that very revolution. Uh, and the revolution which passed between 1925 and 1927 was first and foremost an uprising against imperialism. Now, China had been a society in crisis uh, for the previous 85 years, ever since the British imperialists had opened up the Chinese market by force uh, during the Opium Wars, the first of which uh, began in 1839. Capitalism was not introduced to China by internal forces within Chinese society. It was the imperialists who brought China kicking and screaming into the capitalist world. And, and uh, the, the Chinese peasants uh, rose up uh, uh, against this almost immediately in, in the Taiping uh, Rebellion of, of the 1850s and, and 60s. Uh, but they were not, they were not successful, and the, the imperialists made mind-blowing profits uh, exploiting the labor of the vast country. But unlike a lot of places in the world, you know, China's a huge country. And the imperialists couldn't conquer and colonize China directly. Instead, Britain, France, the United States, and, and other imperialist powers, they divided up the country. They took control of strategically important cities and, and sections of cities, uh, and they enforced their rule in the rest of the country indirectly. And at first, they did this through the intermediation uh, of the old pre-capitalist Chinese ruling class. But of course, the development of capitalism in China changed the class structure of the country. And the most important development uh, in, in the class structure uh, uh, of the country was the development of a working class. And this was a, a new class in Chinese society that was formed uh, out of the raw material of peasants who had been forced off the land because they were too indebted to the, the greedy landlords and, and money lenders. And alongside them, you had urban and village artisans uh, whose small-scale production methods couldn't uh, compete with cheap manufacture from, uh, that was imported from the imperialist countries. Uh, but the ruling class in, in the process of this development changed as well. It's very important to, to note that the, the new Chinese capitalist class that developed, uh, they built up their wealth and power by acting as the local agents uh, of, of the imperialist bourgeoisie. And uh, one of the major mistakes that the, that the CCP leaders made during the 1925 revolution was imagining that this domestic uh, Chinese capitalist class, or at least a significant section of it, would not only join the workers and peasants in their uh, struggle against imperialism, but would actually lead that struggle. Uh, and this was not to be the case. It was not to be the case in 1925 to 27, and it wasn't the case in 1949. Now, when this revolution broke out in 1925, there were really only two political parties uh, of any significance in China. There was the Communist Party, which had been very small, as I say, but uh, in the course of the struggle actually grew to, to at least uh, something like 60,000 uh, members, and that's an important lesson for us. You know, uh, a revolutionary party is never built through calm and gradual accumulation. Uh, the growth of a revolutionary party is conditioned by the rhythm of the class struggle and, and the pace of development of class consciousness. And in periods when the struggle is particularly intense, consciousness can change rapidly and the party can experience explosive growth, and that's exactly what happened to the CCP. And this CCP, it was a real workers' party, right? Most of those 60,000 members were urban proletarians. Now, we know, studying history, that in, in a lot of countries, the trade unions at a certain stage in the development of the class struggle will found a workers' party. But in China, it was actually exactly the opposite. 
the Chinese Communist Party founded the unions uh, in, in China. And these unions very quickly became mass organizations. And, and they provided much of the leadership of the revolution of 1925 to 27. But there was another political party in China uh, called uh, the Guomintang. It's sometimes known as the KMT uh, after its initials or the Chinese Nationalist Party, which is a rough English translation. And this was a bourgeois party founded in the 1890s uh, by liberal Chinese intellectuals. And they were really responding to the fact that the traditional Chinese state was not well suited to the problems presented by the development of capitalism. And their initial vision for China was they wanted a, a kind of democratic republic, uh, like, like the, the kind that they saw in Western Europe or in, in the United States. Uh, and they saw this kind of republic as the key to uniting the whole Chinese nation, the whole of China, Chinese society against the imperialists, kicking them out, and transforming China into a truly independent capitalist power. And they had their chance to do this. There was a, another revolution in 1911, uh, the, the so-called Xinhai Revolution. And this revolution succeeded in overthrowing the last emperor of China and really putting the final nail in the coffin of the traditional political system which had ruled the country more or less continuously since 221 BC. But far from uniting the country, it actually divided the country further. Uh, you know, instead of a stable democratic republic, Thank you, comrade. Uh, what you had was, you know, warlords uh, controlling various parts of the country, and the imperialists still controlled uh, strategically important industrial centers. And the KMT and, and its army, uh, they controlled part, part of the country too, but they, they ended up spending more time fighting the warlords than they did fighting the imperialists. So if you're a Chinese communist, you know, there's this other party there. And, you know, a big question for you is, how do we relate to this other party that exists uh, in society? And really, this question can only be answered by first answering a deeper question, which is, what is the nature of this Chinese revolution that we are living through? And now, uh, a party that is only four years old can't necessarily be expected to develop a good answer to that question. You know, this is a young party. It's, an, it's a largely inexperienced party. Uh, but luckily, there existed uh, the Communist International. And, you know, a Communist International should be able to help a young party to patiently explain the ideas and methods of Marxism and ha help them understand the nature of the processes that are going on in their society so they can develop the correct strategy and tactics. Uh, but unfortunately, this is not what, what happened in, in China. The Russian Revolution itself was in the process of bureaucratic degeneration. And the, the representatives of the Russian bureaucracy, who were also uh, consolidating their control in the Communist International, uh, particularly uh, Stalin and, and Bukharin, they urged the, the CCP, and in fact, more or less ordered the CCP, to take a fundamentally revisionist and, and counter-revolutionary line. Now, when, when we say revisionist, what, what we mean by this is, you know, they called themselves Marxists. They said, we're the Marxists. But the ideas that they actually put forward were, were the diametrical opposite uh, to Marxism. And they said, look, China's a backwards country, deeply backwards country. Uh, and, you know, its working class is small. It's, uh, it's not going to be ready for socialism for some time. And therefore, it's not the role of the Communist Party to lead the Chinese Revolution. It's the role of the bourgeois party, the Kuomintang, uh, to lead the Chinese Revolution. And the role of the Communists is to, is to support and encourage uh, the Kuomintang in its task. Uh, and they even ended up arguing that the Kuomintang was not a bourgeois party at all. Uh, what they said is the Kuomintang, it's really a party of four classes, right? You got the peasants, you got the workers, you got the petty bourgeoisie, you know, these kind of intermediate class. They're not working class, but they're not really big, big capitalists. And, and the, the so-called national bourgeoisie. And this was the, the largely fantastical notion that there was a significant section of the Chinese capitalists who was not so deeply tied to the imperialists 
uh, and that they would actually uh, uh, fight the imperialists. And you know, the idea that you can have a party of four classes, that's nonsense, of course, right? You can have a party with individual members who come from four different classes. Of course you can. But when you are dealing with classes that have fundamentally opposed interests, you know, they have fundamentally opposed needs and, and desires, then a single party can only really represent one of those classes. But based on this four-class uh, uh, absurdity, they even argued for dissolving the Chinese Communist Party into the Kuomintang. Uh, they even made the, the main leader of the KMT at the time, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, they made him an honorary member of the uh, Comintern Executive Committee. Uh, and, you know, the dissolution of the, of the CCP into the KMT was the exact opposite of the advice that Lenin had given to communists in the colonial and semi-colonial countries in 1920. This is the advice that he gave communists in, in, in these countries. He said, communists must not merge with the bourgeois democracy and should, under all circumstances, uphold the independence of the proletarian movement, even in its most embryonic form. But of course, the working class is not going to wait around for the Chinese Communist Party to develop uh, the correct political strategy and tactics. Indeed, in cities all over China, even without firm Marxist leadership, strikes were becoming general strikes. Economic demands were being transformed into political demands. In many cities, you know, the strikers would actually raid police headquarters. Uh, you know, they they take. The, the weapons so that they could confront, confront the class enemy uh, with arms in hand. And what was the response to, of, of the Communist Party to these developments? You know, take, take a second and imagine what your response would be, you know, as communists if, if this happened in this country, you know. Uh, and, and then uh, think about what the, the Communist Party did. They told the workers, the first thing you must not do is take power into your own hands. Uh, they, they even, you know, they, what they said was, we've got to wait for the Kuomintang to show up, right? Uh, they are the ones who are going to lead our revolution. And so, you know, imagine yourself, you know, in, back in, in the cities where you come from, and the workers have raided the police stations, they got their arms, they're all, you know, they're out on a general strike, and you say, hey, you got to wait the Democrats. They're, they're going to lead our revolution. <laughs> um, so obviously, uh, this, this, this was not a good policy. They even argued for the workers to disarm themselves because they said, look, the KMT is going to come. Their army is going to come. And if you're standing here with arms, they're going to think you want to fight them and not accept their political leadership. So you got to disarm yourself. Um, and of course, what, what happened uh, whenever the KMT forces uh, arrived in town? The first thing they did was break the strikes. You know, and this is, this is a, a way that they were not representing four classes, right? They're, they're supposed to be a four-class party. You've got the capitalists. They want the workers to go back to work. You want the workers, or you got the workers. They're on strike. You know, is the KMT going to represent both these classes? No, they represent the capitalist class. They broke the strikes. They killed strikers. They killed communists. They even killed non-communists who they thought were communists. Uh, and this all culminated... Uh, in the Shanghai Massacre on April 12, 1927, when Chiang Kai-shek ordered his troops to slaughter uh, up to 10,000 communists and labor militants and even left-wing members of his own Nationalist Party uh, in, in Shanghai. Uh, and this is another important lesson for us. You know, we, we're sitting here in the, in the reasonably comfortable uh, theater, and, you know, we're talking about Marxism and revisionism, and maybe some comrades are sitting out there thinking, you know, does it really matter all this much, all that much? Is this just a lot of hair splitting? But in the revolution, the question of whether we're guided by Marxist theory or whether we're guided by the reactionary doctrines of revisionism is a matter of life and death for individual comrades and for the revolution itself. Now, Chiang Kai-shek and, and the Chinese capitalists and their imperialist masters must have been pretty pleased with themselves. They had drowned the Chinese revolution in blood. But simply killing your political enemies doesn't actually solve the fundamental problems 
uh, social and economic, which, uh, which caused revolutions in the first place. And so the struggle continues. Now, in the wake of the massacre and, and subsequent defeats in, in 1928, most of the remaining communists fled to the countryside. Now, this, this move was not a tactic uh, worked out in advance, right? Um, this was an improvisation. And even up to uh, the year 1935, the official line of the Communist Party was that this was a temporary move, right? The official line was still, we're going to go back to the cities one day and organize the vanguard of the working class. But things turned out very differently. The move to the countryside ended up fundamentally changing the class composition uh, of, of the party. It went from a party primarily of workers to a party primarily of peasants. Because the 1930s were a difficult time for, for, the, for the CCP. In 1934, the party was actually on the verge of annihilation by the KMT's army. And the communists at that time, they had to flee their initial bases in, in southern China uh, to, to new bases uh, in, in the north during the famous and brutal Long March. Um, and the Long March, it took uh, about a year, and 90% uh, of the, the party members died uh, on, on this march. Um, and and the, the Long March greatly accelerated the changing class composition of the party. Thank you, comrades. Uh, um, and uh, the reason why it changed that, that composition very rapidly uh, is another kind of lesson for us all. You know, if 90% if of your comrades die, you've got some serious recruiting to do. And, um, <laughs> and, and, and if you're in the countryside, who are you going to be recruiting? You're going to be recruiting urban workers? No you're gonna be recruiting uh, from the peasantry. And some people may say, okay, China, it's a, it's a majority peasant society. Maybe it makes more sense to organize the peasantry. After all, peasants are exploited and oppressed uh, under capitalism, just like workers are. What does it matter whether we organize a party of workers or a party of peasants? Well, it's, it's a huge difference, right? Because the political potential of a class, the historical trajectory of a class, is rooted in the conditions under which it lives and works. And workers and peasants are both exploited, but the conditions of their exploitation are very different. Workers toil away in big workplaces alongside hundreds, thousands, in some cases even tens of thousands of fellow workers. And, you know, a lot of workers, they start out trying to use uh, individual means to improve their lives. I was talking to a comrade uh, out, out front uh, before the session. One of, one of the things he mentioned was when he first started working, he, he was trying to use individual means to, to get ahead. Um, but eventually, uh, like this comrade outside, you know, workers learn the power that they really have. And the power that they really have is their size their concentration, and the fact that they play this crucial role uh, in production. And they, they eventually learn that collective struggle is the key to liberation. But the unit of production for the peasant is usually always the family. Uh, and as a result, peasants rarely develop the kind of collective consciousness that workers can. Now, that doesn't mean that peasants will never unite and fight. But ultimately, the peasantry like all intermediate classes standing between the workers and the, and the capitalists, is not really capable of developing an independent class line. It will always be led politically by one or other of the main classes in society. Marx summed this up very succinctly. And uh, he was talking about the Taiping uh, Rebellion, the first uh, uprising against imperialism in China. And what he said was, Eastern empires always show an unchanging social infrastructure coupled with an unceasing change in the persons and tribes who managed to ascribe themselves to the political superstructure. 
What did he mean by this? What he meant is that the faces at the top can change and change and change and change, but they're never able to change the fundamental way society organizes itself. As Marx said, the peasant rebels are not conscious of any task except the change of dynasty. They have no germ of a new social formation. So if you look at China, long history of, of peasant revolts going back at least to the third century BC. Uh, and many of these were successful in, uh, in overthrowing a dynasty. But what happened then, right? Were, were the peasants able to organize a new type of society? No. You know, a particularly lucky and skilled military commander just declared himself to be the new emperor. Nothing really changed. You know, China's probably home to the majority of successful peasant uprisings in human history. The, the country is very, very well suited to peasant revolt. Uh, for reasons that, that there's really not time to get into. But if you study failed peasant revolutions anywhere in the world, you often find them following a similar pattern. You know, the peasants will rise up either in the wintertime or the summertime, and they form a powerful army, and they fight against the landlords, and they do really, really, really well until it becomes springtime or autumn. Then each individual peasant says to themselves, whoa, I got to go tend to my fields, right? It's time to sow or to reap, depending on what the season is. And if I don't do it, this is not going to be a very good year for me and my family. And most all of the peasants think this way. And the army just kind of melts away. And the, the most stubborn elements who don't melt away, they get slaughtered. And you don't see that kind of thing in a proletarian revolution, right? In the middle of the workers' insurrection, uh, w when it happens in this country, you're not going to have workers looking at the time and saying, my shift starts in 20 minutes. <laughs> I, I better get to work or else they're going to dock my pay. Um, and, you know, saying all that about the, the nature of, of, of peasant consciousness and peasant struggle, that doesn't mean that the struggle between peasants and landlords isn't an important one, right? It's simply the case that the peasantry cannot carry through a revolution against the landlords based purely on its own forces. It requires not only an alliance, but it requires the leadership of one of the urban classes. And, and that's a very important factor. Um, Trotsky said of this, the historical mission of the proletariat grows to a considerable extent precisely out of the inability of the peasantry to liberate itself by means of its own forces. And of course, you know, a revolution in the countryside to seize the land and distribute it to the peasants, that cannot take place without the active participation of the peasants, without peasant committees, without the peasants arming themselves. But ultimately, if you look at the whole history of capitalism, the development of capitalism, it's a history of the countryside being politically and economically and socially and culturally subordinated uh, to the cities. You know, the cities exercising increasing power and control over the countryside. And that means that the question of the agrarian revolution, the question of whether the peasants get land or not, is ultimately not going to be settled in the countryside. It's going to be settled in the cities. And that was true even in the Chinese Revolution uh, of 1949. You know, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I'll, I'll tell you that the, the Communist Party of China and the People's Liberation Army, they struck blows against the landlords to various extents at various times in the Civil War. But landlordism was not decisively smashed in China until the army entered the cities, right? It was in the cities that the question was decided. And of course, the Marxists said this all along because we understood uh, that, that that was the consequence of the way capitalism developed. So in the 1930s, the CCP becomes primarily a peasant party. And uh, such a dramatic change is going to have to express itself in a corresponding change of leadership. Now, I imagine I've been up here 25, 30 minutes or something. And uh, you may notice that there's a name I haven't mentioned, uh, Mao Zedong. Uh, and, and I must stress to you all that this is not an error on my part. I totally meant to do that. Um, 
And, and the reason why I meant to do that is because Mao as an individual was not that important, right? He was primarily an accidental figure. The significance of Mao historically is that he emerged as the representative of this change in the class composition uh, of the party. And so during the Long March in, in January of, of 1935, uh, the, the PL or, or the Workers and Peasants uh, Red Army, as it was called at that time, uh, seized uh, this little town called Zunyi. And they, they had a, a conference there. Uh, and a new leadership team led by Mao uh, deposed the old leadership uh, around uh, Wang Ming. And this is an absolutely fascinating event, but unfortunately, time does not really allow me to go into it. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the Long March was really a long retreat from the onslaught of the KMT. And even after the march, the CCP was really on the ropes. And Chiang Kai-shek and the KMT might have delivered a knockout blow, except for a, a little matter uh, called the Second World War. When uh, the Japanese invaded uh, China, S Stalin and Mao saw this as an ideal time to try again to get an alliance with Chiang Kai-shek and the KMT and through them to secure an alliance with the mythical national bourgeoisie. Indeed, in response to the war, the Chinese Communist Party took an even more opportunist line than they had in the 1920s, as Mao explained. Pursuing its zigzag course, the Chinese Revolution has again arrived at a united front of the four classes. But the scope of this united front is now much broader because its upper stratum includes many members of the ruling classes, its middle stratum includes the national bourgeoisie and petty bourgeoisie, and its lower stratum includes the entire proletariat, so that the various classes and strata of the nation uh, have become members of the alliance resolutely resisting Japanese imperialism. Now that last bit about Japanese imperialism uh, was really wishful thinking. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, the KMT wasn't particularly interested in fighting the Japanese. Uh, at, the, at the beginning of the war, Chiang Kai-shek actually said, you know, we will fight the Japanese, but only after we have destroyed the communists, right? Destroying the communists is absolutely essential precondition for fighting against the Japanese. Now, in spite of all this, uh, the CCP was able to secure an alliance uh, with Chiang Kai-shek, and they did so at gunpoint. Uh, during a, a very interesting thing called the, the Xi'an Incident uh, in 1936. And the whole affair is really fascinating. Unfortunately, we don't have time to, to get into it. But basically what happened was that the Communist Party, through a set of very curious chances, managed to capture Chiang Kai-shek. And it's interesting to note, in the 1920s, Trotsky tried to give a lot of advice to, to the Chinese Communists you know, in, in opposition to what Stalin and the Stalinists were saying. And one of the pieces that he had, of advice that he gave in the 20s was that he said that the, the Communist Party of China should shoot any KMT general who opposed Soviet power. Um, and Chiang Kai-shek had actually made himself a generalissimo. He'd promoted himself to generalissimo after the Shanghai massacre. But instead of putting him up against uh, the nearest wall, they offered to form what they called a united front. And they offered lots of concessions, right? Even going so far as to let KMT generals uh, command communist forces. Interestingly, one of the concessions they made to show that they were really serious class collaborationists was to strip a lot of the class terms out of their organization. So as I said, the PLA was originally called the Workers and Peasants Red Army, but it becomes the People's Liberation Army. Uh, they had also been calling their rural bases Soviets. Now they weren't Soviets in, in the sense of being workers or peasants or soldiers' councils. But they called these areas Soviets, uh, you know, because of uh, the, the weight that that term had in the international working class movement. They dropped that, right? This is why the country ends up being called the People's Republic of China and not the Chinese Soviet Socialist Republic or something like that. And, uh, you know, Chiang Kai-shek, he changed his position. You know, despite having shown himself to be an anti-communist of the most murderous sort, he decided, apparently, 
that a united front with the communists was superior to a bullet in the back of the head. Um, but an ally won over in this way, rather than solid political arguments, is never going to be the most reliable one. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that after they let Zhang go, he still didn't do very much uh, to, to fight the Japanese. The KMT gave battle against the Japanese only very rarely. And usually the reason why they, they would uh, get into a battle with the Japanese was, was for political reasons, right? People would be criticizing them, saying, you never fight the Japanese, you never fight the Japanese. So every once in a while, they had to, they had to fight the Japanese. Say, see, you know, we don't always retreat. And like the Battle of Shanghai is a great example in, in 1937. Um, you know, the KMT had been retreating and retreating and retreating over vast, vast territory. And it was just like, it was not a politically good look to surrender Shanghai without a fight. And so they fought. And, um, you know, it was an absolutely horrific battle. It was a Stalingrad uh, scale battle. And the KMT got absolutely slaughtered. And the Second World War was the real impetus that allowed the Chinese Communist Party to take power. It was the political sympathy uh, and the political authority that they won simply by being the only force in China which was willing to fight the invader. Um, they didn't actually do that well militarily when they fought. Um, and if the Communist Party had actually tried to use some proletarian methods of struggle, if, for example, when the, the Japanese imperialists invaded, they decided that we're going to start organizing the workers in all the industrial cities and we're going to work towards a national general strike against the occupation, that might have been very effective. But the the you know, the means they, they used against the Japanese were not particularly effective, right? The Japanese didn't lose the Second World War because of the resistance of the Chinese Communist Party, heroic as it was. Um, but the main thing is that they fought. And, you know, conversely, uh, the KMT lost support because of their cowardice in, in the face of the enemy. And despite the, the so-called united front, you know, the, the KMT clashed with the communists uh, during the war. Chang was still more willing to fight against the communists than he was to fight against the Japanese. But things between these two parties really came to a head uh, after the, the Second World War when the Civil War resumed. Uh, and it, it's important to note that it's not the communists who started the Civil War again. The, the CCP leaders and Mao what they wanted after the war is they wanted to stay as junior partners uh, to the man that they still considered to be their patriotic wartime ally. Uh, but, but that patriotic wartime ally, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, he wanted a fight. And he was very confident that he was going to win. And, and he was confident for a number of reasons. Uh, and one of these reasons was he had the backing of the US imperialists. They actually stepped in at the end of the war and in, in a lot of parts of China, the US imperialists were the ones who accepted Japanese surrender. And the reason for that was the KMT was so far from the front lines that they couldn't make it in time to accept the surrender. The US imperialists didn't want the communists to accept the surrender, so they stepped in. You know, They sent Marines uh, to accept the surrender in a, in a lot of places. And during the Civil War, the US imperialists gave massive economic and military aid to the KMT. Um, you know, I was looking at some figures, and, and the best I can tell is that this aid totaled the equivalent in today's money of about 70 to $75 billion. And that only goes to show that the, the US imperialists did not invent giving tens of billions of dollars to a hopeless cause in, in the Ukraine, right? They've, they've been doing this for years. Um, and, and the KMT, they, they had a seemingly large numerical advantage uh, over the PLA. There were five uh, KMT soldiers for every one of the PLA. But this advantage uh, was, was largely illusory, right? The fact of the matter is Chinese capitalism was in deep decay after the Second World War, and this was expressed inside the KMT's uh, armed forces. And so 30 to 40% of their soldiers actually only existed on paper. Because what would happen was an officer would claim that he had more troops uh, under his command than he really did. The treasury would pay him enough to pay the wages of all the troops he claimed to have, and he'd pocket the difference, right? Uh, and if that wasn't enough, you know, the KMT army was one of the worst fed armies in modern history, and the reason for that wasn't that they didn't have rations. 
is that the officers would sell the food ration of their, of their own troops on, on the market to make money. There are even cases where KMT officers sold American weapons to the PLA, right? You know, capitalism's in decay, and if you're a, 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 an officer in a, in a capitalist army that is, in, in, a, in a capitalist state that is falling apart at the seams, you know, you're not gonna, you know, do your duty in a, in a you know, efficient and, and disciplined way. You're gonna try to get, what, uh, get out of it what you can. Um, and the class dynamics inside those KMT forces played a decisive role, right? The KMT recruited in a very brutal fashion. Basically, they would move into a, a little peasant village, usually a very poor one, and they take all the, all the young military age men, and they would literally bind them together with ropes around their neck, and they'd force march them to basic training. You know I, know, I know there are comrades in the room who've been to basic training in, in, in this country, and they, they put you on like a nice coach bus uh, over to basic training, but that's not how the KMT did it, right? And it wasn't uncommon for, you know, 50% of the recruits to die or desert before they even reached the training base, right? And, and the, the Chinese Communist Party were, were very adept at, at exploiting this. Um, and what they did was they offered a plot of land to any KMT soldier who defected. Um, and, you know, this was very attractive, right? The, the KMT soldiers were mainly poor peasants and they wanted nothing more in life than a little plot of land. Now, there's a kind of myth about the Chinese Communist Party in this period that they had this policy of land to the tiller. Uh, and whenever they moved into an area, they seized, thank you, comrades, seized all the land from the landlords and parceled it out uh, among the peasants. And there were periods when they did this. At the beginning uh, of, of the first civil war in the late 20s, they actually did do that. And at the very end of the Chinese civil war, they, they also did that. But in the middle, their land reforms tended to be quite moderate and quite limited. And the reason was that they didn't really want an all-out fight with the landlords, and they didn't want an all-out fight with uh, the, the ruling classes. Um, but in terms of the KMT uh, soldiers, they, they got the policy right, right? By offering a plot of land, you know, these KMT grunts came over to, to the PLA in droves. And by 1948, the numerical advantage had shifted decisively in favor of the Communist Party. They moved from guerrilla tactics to positional warfare, right? The KMT, you know, they, they had learned to retreat very well in the Second World War, and they put that to great use in the Civil War. They retreated, they gave up most cities without a fight. Um, you know, in, in addition to having the most desertions of any army in history, they were probably also the, the fastest retreating uh, army in history. Only Shanghai resisted. Once again, you know, politically, it's, it's not a good look to give up Shanghai without a fight. Shanghai resisted a little bit, but not particularly well. And so finally, on October 1st, 1949, Mao declared that China was now a people's republic. Chiang Kai-shek and his remaining KMT hangers-on fled to the island of Taiwan, uh, where he continued to be a blood-soaked dictatorial capitalist bastard until his death in 1975. Um, and, you know, long before 1949, Trotsky predicted that the decisive question of the Chinese Revolution would be settled when the, uh, the, the Communist Party's army entered the cities. Uh, if, if the workers could organize themselves into Soviets, into workers' councils, if they could use these workers' councils to take political power firmly into their hands, they could build a healthy worker state and begin the socialist construction of society. This new China would serve as a beacon for workers all over the world. Uh, and the Chinese Revolution could have been a spark to ignite the World Revolution. Um, you know, it was altogether possible. In parallel, in parallel with the development of the Civil War, there was a huge development in the class struggle uh, in, in China uh, during the 1940s. In 1936, there were only 278 strikes in all of China. Um, by 1946, there were 1,716. Uh, strikes recorded in Shanghai alone. And in 1947, the number reached uh, 2,538. 
in Shanghai alone. And alongside these worker struggles, there had developed a, a very strong student movement, uh, first against Japanese imperialism, and then it continued in the Civil War. But the radical workers and students in the cities in China who were moving into class struggle were absolutely disconnected from the CCP. Whenever an urban communist uh, you know, got in touch with, with the Communist Party, which was not that easy to do, they would be told, you've got to come to the countryside and join uh, the PLA. Now, once the army reached the cities, instead of calling on the working class to overthrow the bourgeois state, Mao actually formed a coalition government with various little splinter groups that had split off uh, from the KMT and really didn't represent anything. Far from encouraging the, the independent initiative of the working class masses, uh, when the PLA entered cities and towns, they called on the workers not to strike, not to hold demonstrations, and uh, any manifestation of independent action was repressed. Uh, and there's a very good reason for this, right? Um, even after their stunning victory over the decrepit Chinese capitalist state, the CCP leaders did not intend to go beyond the limits of capitalism. Landlordism was through. They did carry out a, a sweeping land reform, but Mao's perspective was that China would be a new democracy, where the CCP would lead an alliance of the four classes while China passed through a century of capitalist development, and only then would it be ready for socialism. Um, and this was just a, a recapitulation of the old Stalinist two-stage theory, uh, which itself was just a recapitulation of the old Menshevik line from the Russian Revolution. But despite this perspective, Mao and the Chinese Communist Party uh, were only able to enjoy four years of new democracy. You see, the CCP never would have achieved victory uh, except for the absolute rottenness and bankruptcy of Chinese capitalism. And whether it fit with their Stalinist Maoist preconceptions or not, the only way forward for China at this time uh, was to nationalize the main levers of the economy, to create a central plan, to uh, enforce a state monopoly uh, over foreign trade. In short, the development of Chinese capitalism had reached a point where only a worker state could move society forward. And Mao and the Communist Party, they had to recognize this. In 1953, uh, Mao said the following, our present revolutionary struggle is even more profound than the revolutionary armed struggle of the past. It is a revolution that will bury the capitalist system and other systems of exploitation once and for all. Those who say firmly establish the new democratic order, i.e. those who say what Mao was saying four years ago and last year, uh, those people go against the realities of our struggle and hinder the progress of the socialist cause. Um, quite an indictment of your own line uh, from four years ago. Um, but it wasn't socialism as envisioned by Marx and Lenin, firmly based in the political power uh, of the working class. You know, the Communist Party built a worker state after the image of their political mentors in Stalin's Soviet Union. And this was a result of, of the way the revolution was carried through by a peasant army, right? Because if we, if we understand that the peasants can't lead themselves, right? They need to be led by the capitalists or the workers. And if they're not led by the capitalists and they're not led by the workers, well, there's a vacuum and who fills it? Well, the Chinese bureaucracy, that's who fills it. Nevertheless, the Chinese worker state transformed the country from a devastated and, in, and impoverished an oppressed uh, basket case to a major world power. The centrally planned nationalized economy lifted millions of workers and peasants out of poverty. Uh, you know, in 1949, China was 85% peasant, and today it has the largest working class in the world. Uh, but socialism needs democracy. It needs workers' democracy. Like the body needs oxygen. Um, for any deformed worker state, there are only two options. Either the working class finds some means to sweep aside the bureaucratic parasites, or capitalism is restored. And unfortunately, the latter happened in the Chinese case. But that's not the end of the story. The final chapters of the Chinese revolution remain to be written. The immense potential of the Chinese working class is far from exhausted. 
And anybody who doubts that should only look at the tremendous wave of strikes and, and mass demonstrations uh, that happened at the end of last year and the beginning of this year. <laughs> thank, thank you, Kevin. Uh, in, in future generations, you know, the Chinese Revolution of 1949 is not going to be remembered as the second greatest event in world history. In the future, it will be remembered as the beginning of the end of the prehistory of Chinese civilization. And there can be absolutely no doubt, comrades, that under the leadership of a new communist international, which we in the IMT are building even today, the Chinese workers will play a central role in the coming world revolution, which will put an end to capitalism once and for all. Thank you, comrades. Like